most of all, for your son, Jesus Christ, and the blood he shed on Calvary for us, Heavenly Father. For that, we're thankful. And just thinking about this uh, Sunday school lesson that you've given us today, we think about giving gifts, Heavenly Father. You gave us your uh, the greatest gift, uh, greatest example of your love in Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father. And like I said, we, we're thankful of that. But also, as the lesson points out, if we truly are thankful, our actions should show in what we offer to you. So we ask you to forgive us for all we've done, and uh, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We ask you just bless uh, the service today. Uh, bless uh, anywhere where any parts of your body is gathered and uh, your word is preached and taught. We ask you to give our pastor traveling grace, give him the strength he needs as he preaches this morning, Heavenly Father. And we just thank you for all that you've done these past 42 years in this ministry. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, okay, so <clears throat> we're still in Leviticus chapter 22, and we're talking about obedience and offerings, obedience and offerings. And we know we've just been covering uh, obedience across, and um, we talked about leadership uh, and remembrance. Um, then we talked about the promise of obedience. Then we talked about respect and obedience, worshiping. Um, in building the tabernacle. Last week we talked about the day of atonement. And so today we're going to talk about concerning offerings, obedience and offerings. So I want to read this introduction um, before we get into um, the uh, lesson in the 22nd chapter of Leviticus. It says, charities to aid the poor are common in our society. It says, we frequently receive their appeals for used clothing, appliances, or household items. But there are limits to what they will take. They do not want junk. They do not want clothing with patches or holes. Some specify that the clothing be gently used. Appliances that no longer work are unacceptable. As are broken lamps, dressers, or bed frames. Items like these insult the poor they are supposed to help. So now he's going on to say, if there are limits concerning the gifts we give to other human beings, now here's the question, how much more are there restrictions concerning what we give to our God? It says, indeed, scripture makes it clear that only the best is pleasing to him. He is not satisfied with leftovers. So this is what we're going to talk about this week. But before we get into Leviticus, open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, because we're talking about giving God our best. And I want to go back to the book of beginnings. So as we get into our lesson, that way we show that this is nothing new. This is nothing new. This is something that was required ever since um, they were in Genesis. Um, Genesis chapter 4. We'll start with um, verse 2. Genesis chapter 4, starting at verse 2. And I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it states, um, Then she bore again, this time his brother, Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Verse 3, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Verse 5, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Now you think about it. This is in the book of the beginnings. This is the first family. Now they've had offspring, Cain and Abel. Now one kept uh, animals, livestock. The other one was a farmer. So... Based off what they brought in, they gave it to God. They offered it to God, right? Now, to understand what went wrong, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4. I'm not, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, starting at verse 4. And we're talking about obedience and offering. Obedience and offering. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11, starting at verse 4. And we'll see what went wrong. So as we get into the lesson, we keep this in mind. 
We just don't offer our God anything. So Hebrews chapter 11, starting at verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it being dead, still speaks. That's how powerful his offering was to God. And as we get into the lesson today, it's not enough when we collect tithes and offerings just to put something in the basket. What's your attitude? What's your approach in your offering to God? That's what this lesson's about. Being obedient. Why? Because you recognize something. We see these two brothers in, in Genesis. God had given them both one land to work, the other one livestock to grow. And as a result, they offered it to God. God accepted one, but he rejected other. Why? Because the other one's approach and attitude wasn't in the right place. Now, God's same God. Now, let's look at the Sunday school lesson, Leviticus 22, starting in verse 17. And the Lord spake unto Moses. Verse 18, speak unto Aaron and to his sons and unto all the children of Israel and say unto them, whatsoever he be of the, whatsoever he be of the house of Israel or of the strangers in Israel that will offer his oblation for all his vows and for all his free will offerings, which they will offer unto the Lord for a burnt offering. So basically he's letting them know everybody, not only the Israelites, the strangers, the foreign, anybody that's coming through is required to give an offering. Verse 19, ye shall offer at your own will a male without blemish and the beeves of the sheep or of the goats. And beeves just simply means cattle, another word for cattle. So basically what he's saying, this is what you shall offer, but not only should you offer it, but I don't want any blemishes. God is requiring their best. Same thing he requires of us today. Nothing has changed. Same God, same character, uh, same things. His requirements have never changed. And we go back to the lesson where the children of Israel, he's establishing something. Now, I done brought you out. And this is the reason why it really shouldn't be an argument on the types of offerings you give me. Now, you, your people have been in captivity in Egypt for over four hundred years I raised up Moses sent him to you before uh, Pharaoh let you out before I brought you out ten plagues was issued against ten gods in Egypt but the whole time these plagues were issued you were protected in the midst of it the last plague you were protected according to your obedience of sacrificing the lamb and putting the blood on the doorpost. So because I did this and not a, I didn't just stop at this. I brought you out and I allowed you to walk through on dry land in the midst of the Red Sea. I, you were able to see Pharaoh and his soldiers destroyed. I did all this. And now I done brought you out. I'm feeding you manna from heaven. I'm giving you water from the rock. The least you can do is bring me a sacrifice with no blemishes. The least you could do after all these things I just named off. And we're not even talking about what they knew was done before then. Because they gave a lot of history orally. Everything wasn't written down like we have it today. They orally, they sat down and they talked to their kids and they told them about the past times. But the least you can do is give me, um, offer this male without blemish. Why? Because it's not just for y'all, but it's for the future too. It's not just for now, it's pointing to something. Even when we're going through now, and even as we learn of God, everything has a point, a purpose. And it's not just for now. It's pointing towards the future. Same thing he did back then, same thing he's doing right now. Um, 
verse 20, but whatsoever hath a blemish, that shall ye not offer, for it shall not be acceptable for you. So he's telling them right out the gate, don't bring me no tainted sacrifice. Don't bring me nothing tainted. And what's amazing, they already had an example in Aaron's two sons. They already had an example. They offered profane fire and was killed. So they had an example of what not to do. These won't be acceptable if they have blemishes. So what do we think about today when we offer God anything less than our best? Whether it be in our tithes and offerings, if you're in the choir, in your song, in your ministering, in your preaching and teaching, in your in, in whatever you uh, are doing in the kingdom of God, what do you think God does when you give him your half best? Because we don't feel like it that day. If he didn't accept crippled animals, blemished animals back then, what do you think he does when we get up and we do stuff in the kingdom? But we do it half-heartedly. He said in verse 20, For it shall not be acceptable for you. 21, And whosoever authoreth the sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow, or a free will offering in the beavies of sheep, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein. So he goes on and he's talking about some more offerings and we'll go through and talk about what these offerings represented, but he's going through and he's telling them even in the free will and in the peace offering, whatever you offer, there shall be no blemishes. So he's being specific. Why? Because we humans and we look naturally look for a shortcut when we're given stuff to do. We do. We, 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 it's just in us. That, that's part of being in this flesh. I heard what they said, but let me see if I can figure out another way. You know, save me five minutes. Uh, save me five dollars. Uh, don't we do it, y'all? We, we naturally go, go towards that. That's what all children do. You tell your children at home to do something. I know mom and daddy said this, but dig. This is how we going to work it. That, 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 that's just part of the human factor. That's just part of being human. Well, God said, not so with me. I want your best. Give me your best. Give me your best. Then he goes on to say in 22, blind or broken or maimed or having a wing, a scurvy, a scab, ye shall not offer uh, these unto the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them upon the um, altar unto the Lord. So now he's going and he's naming out four or five specific things. If they itching, they got some kind of discharge. All these different, don't put that on the altar and give it to me. He has to be specific. Please go to the mic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's true. Regardless of the process, we've been given a principle. We've been given a principle. Yeah, that, and the burn is part of the process. But before it gets burnt, I need it to be perfect. That shortcut, you're absolutely right. But think about it. Jesus on the cross, he had to be perfect. Without sin, without flaw. God would accept nothing less so because all of these sacrifices are pointing to him, no compromise. Because God already knew what I'm sending up the line. So all these sacrifices point to the seed of the woman that he introduced us to back in Genesis. It points to that. Just like the things we're going through now with COVID and the economy up and down and this racial tension and just so much divide, you know, what th this was already prophesied, but it's pointing to the culmination of time 
when Jesus comes back for his church and then he comes down to reign on earth. It's not without meaning. It's not without purpose. But he's been, we've been given a principle in Matthew 28, 19 to go and make disciples. That doesn't change. No matter how bad these times get, the mandate's been given for the church. And Jesus simply said, go and make disciples. And it's going to get rough for saints. But once again, Jesus said, go. See, we're looking for shortcuts, Brother Charlie, but the principle remains the same. But Lord, we was on lockdown for two years. Go. Why would you lie to God? You didn't sit in the house those four two years. They told you stay home. You, you thought of got creative of how I can get out the house. So he said, go. The principles never change. 23, either a bullock or a lamb that have anything superfluous or lacking in, its, in his parts, um, that mayest thou offer for a free will offering, but for a vow it shall not be accepted. So here's the one exception the Lord made for a free will offering. And the superfluous, this word um, simply means that the animal had a natural defect. A natural defect, meaning it wasn't a disease. It was something that was born a specific way, maybe with a limb that was longer than the other. Theologians go back and forth. But this is the only exception he made, and it was only to be used on a free will offering. Not a peace offering, not a sin offering just for a free will offering did the Lord make this exception. But in that, he was still specific. And he said exactly when he would accept it. And that's it. I'll take it for the free will, but not the vow. And once again, it was without disease. It was none of those um, that we've seen in verse 22. And this is why we must study God's word. This is why we must listen with our ears and with our heart. Because if we're listening, then we'll understand it. And then after we get understanding, we'll apply it. And as you apply it, it becomes a habit. And then in turn, it becomes your witness for others. And here's the thing, like we just said, some of the stuff we don't want to hear. In our humanity, we don't want to hear it. But we cannot compromise when it comes to the things that we offer to God. Period. Period. And as we know in Israel history, this is what got them in trouble. Why? How did they get in 70 years of captivity? Because they were disobedient. <clears throat> Excuse me. In what they offered to God. Verse 24, ye shall not offer unto the Lord that which is bruised or crushed or broken or cut. Neither shall ye make any offering thereof in your land. So he's, he's being very specific. Now, now if your animal got um, um, done fell and hurt itself, don't offer it to me. If, if, if it got injured any kind of way or you rolled over with your cart, whatever, I don't want it. Not even the scraps. That's right, D. I want your best. Why? Because I'm getting ready to give you my best. And see, just if we can, just for one minute, think about the way God thinks as a good father. Now, before we get to God, let's think about us. So um, Christmas time, birthday, all these different times where we give gifts, amen? So let's think of it as parents or uncles or aunts or however it make up. So you, you, you got your, your, your children, and you know they've been asking, they've been hinting and telling you something they want, right? And you know the older they get, they get slick, so they start asking earlier in the year, so they feel like if I talk up on it, 
come December or come my birthday, I'll get it. Amen. So as a good parent, you in your mind, you, you think to yourself, well, that's a reasonable request. However, because certain rules have been given in the house, if he or she act right, but you're saying it to yourself, you ain't saying it to them, but you're saying it to yourself. If they act right, come birthday or Christmas, I'll bless you with it. But here's what happened. They act a fool. Grades ain't good. The street lights keep catching them on. They talking back. There's a strange smell coming out their room. I, I got dishes in my sink. But come that day, they want a gift. But they lacked in doing all these things I just said. So let's take it to God's perspective. He already knew that Jesus was the answer for this sin sick condition. But what he's doing, he's setting up all these other things to point to him. But it's a shame when it comes to the Israelites. I gave you the tabernacle. I gave you the sacrificial system. I gave you the priesthood. I gave you types of Christ and Moses. And, and I gave you the prophets. But when the Messiah came, you rejected him. This is what was given to God, even though he gave us his best. He gave them the sacrificial system to point to the greatest gift that can ever be bestowed on mankind. And that's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we missed it. Some, some people missed it. And then some of us are still missing it now. Why? Because we offer God whatever, whenever. Instead of us raising up to the bar, we done brought God down to our level. And as a result, we find ourselves in a vicious cycle. And it's hurting us. Not only is it hurting us, it's hurting the onlookers. Because they looking at you like, if this is what a Christian is, I don't know if I won't be bothered with that. Verse 25, neither from a stranger's hand shall ye offer the bread of your God of any of these, because their corruption is in them, and blemishes be in them. They shall not be accepted for you. Verse 31, therefore shall ye keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. And it's amazing. He keeps on letting them know. Keep my commandments, because I am the Lord. And it's amazing. He, he's, he's prepared to give them this land. He's keeping his promises. As a matter of fact, he kept his promise in bringing them out after 400 years in slavery. Now he's keeping his promise and he's getting ready. I'm bringing you out to worship, but the thing of it is, you've been surrounded by this pagan worship for so long, you don't understand what true worship is. So I'm bringing you out to this wilderness to retrain you and show you what worship actually looks like. We shouldn't re reject or despise the teaching of the kingdom. Last week, we were blessed to have an evangelist come out, and, and, and he taught us on um, leadership. Then he talked to us about unity and getting the right thought process so we can come together and be unified as a church. And then Friday, he preached about that we got something to shout about. So what I'm saying is it's free. Only thing it costs you is the gas that it takes to get here. And by chance, if you didn't have the gas, we have a van ministry. And the van, if you call them, will come get you. So realistically, at the end of the day, all it does is cost you some time. About two, two and a half hours to be exact. Now you think about what God has done for us. He allowed his son, Jesus Christ, to come down here to die on the cross. He was buried and he rose on the third day and he witnessed and then he ascended back to heaven. Then he sent the Holy Spirit that indwells inside of us. Then we have the complete Bible. 
Now you're here to tell me that two and a half hours, seven and a half, eight hours altogether is too much to sacrifice out of a week for a God who has given us any and everything we'll ever need for here and into eternity. And not even just, just, just this week, I'm just saying in general, because as we bring it to today's terms, this, this is what we have to sacrifice. This is part of our sacrifice, our worship. How do we worship God now? What, what are we doing? But before we get that, I want to go through the offerings and then we'll um, finish it out in, in today's terms. So let's look at the burnt offering. So the burnt offering, the purpose was to appropriate for the sins, just general sin, um, to signify complete dedication and consecration to God. Hence, it is called the whole burnt offering. And it consisted of, I love it, because God did it according to your wealth. For those who had money, they could get a bull because they could afford it. Um, those that had a little less money, you get a male sheep or a goat without blemish. And then for the poorest citizens, turtle doves or two young pigeons. God didn't leave nobody out when it came to repentance for sin. Now the priest got a portion. He, he was able to keep the skin and it, it signifies complete dedication to uh, a life uh, to God on the part of Christ and on the part of the believer. This is the burn offering. Next, you got the grain offering. And this is a voluntarily offering. Now, the purpose of the grain offering, it accompanied all the burnt offerings and it signified one's homage and thanksgiving to God. This is what I like to call that good measure. Not only am I offering the bull offering, but the grain as well. Because thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. They did this back then. And it consisted of three types of fine flour mixed with oil and frankincense. That's where you got that sweet smelling aroma that pleased the Lord. Uh, cakes made of fine flour mixed with oil and baked in the oven or, or in a pan or, or in a covered pan. Then also just the green heads of roasted grain mixed with oil and frankincense. And then um, the priest portion, the remainder is to be eaten in the court of the tabernacle. And it's amazing, the priests were able to keep some stuff and even um, God uh, signified and set a place apart where they were supposed to eat it as well. And then the prophetic, prophetic significance is the absence of the leaven typifies the sinlessness of Christ. The presence of the oil is emblematic of the Holy Spirit. See how it points to. It points to something. So these are not just rituals. This is building a relationship with God. Everything had a reason. The peace offering, once again, this is voluntary. The peace offering generally expressed peace and fellowship between the uh, offerer and God. Hence, there were three types. A thank offering to express gratitude for an unexpected blessing or deliverance. Now, how many of us today just thank God? Just because. Just because. Not because you did something, but for who you are. God, I thank you. Then there's a votive offering to express gratitude for a blessing or deliverance granted when a vow had an accompanied position. Now, this is just simply thanking for answered prayer. Then there's a free will offer to express gratitude to God without regard to any specific blessing or deliverance. This is another one. Just thank you, Lord. Just because. And then this was also consisted according to wealth uh, from a herd, uh, a male or female without blemish. Then it drops down to a flock of male or female without blemish. And then uh, for the, uh, lo the last, the least from the goats. Now, the priests, um, they did a wave offering with it, and they were able to do the um, keep the breasts. That was an offering for them. It was also called a heave offering. And um, prophetic significance foreshadows the peace which the believer has with God through Jesus Christ. And then we're at the sin offering. 
And the purpose is to atone for sins committed unknowingly, especially where no restitution was possible. And it consisted of, for the high priest, a bull without blemish. For the congregation, a bull without blemish. For a ruler, a male goat without blemish. Uh, for a commoner, a female goat or a female lamb without blemishes. And then it also says in cases of poverty, two turtle doves and two young pigeons. Um, and then it said in case of extreme poverty, God would even accept fine flour could be substituted. So there was no reason not to offer sacrifices for your sin. And the prophetic significance, Christ was made sin for us. And then secondly, Christ suffered outside the gates of Jerusalem. And then lastly, there was a trespass offering. The purpose is to atone for sins committed unknowingly, especially where restitution was possible. And it uh, consisted of if the offense were against the Lord whether it be in tithes and offerings, a ram without blemish was to be brought. Restitution was reckoned according to the priest's estimate of the value of the trespass plus one-fifth. Um, secondly, if the offense were against a uh, man, a ram without blemish was to be brought. Restitution was reckoned according to the value plus one-fifth. And then the priest was allowed a portion, said the remainder was to be eaten in the holy place, and then the prophetic significance foreshadows the fact that Christ is also our trespass offering. So these are the different offerings that they were required to do and to give back then. And it's amazing. I want to, um, before we go um, to the New Testament and, and look at what we're supposed to do today, turn to Malachi, the first chapter. Malachi, the first chapter. That's the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi. And we'll start at uh, verse 6. Malachi, the first chapter, starting at verse 6. And this is basically talking about polluted offerings. And it says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, this is God asking the question, where is my honor when it comes to offerings? And if I'm a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name, yet you say, in which way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lamb and sick, is it not evil? Offer it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? So God is asking him. Now, all these things that I've created, you, you offer them stuff. But I'm even greater than them. Now, would you offer your governor your worst? No. We had the governor come here. We, we, we gave him a seat right up front. Now, what happened if we told him, go sit over there and we'll call you? When it's time for you to speak. Do you think he would have been happy with that seat? So why do we give God our second best? Why do we give God our second best? <laughs> Let's turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Now, what should we be doing when it comes to offering? Romans 12, starting at verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then he goes on to help us out. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So in today's terms, what, 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 what should be placed on the altar? What should be offered to God when we come to the altar and you look at this altar right here? What should be on there according to Romans 12? Us. Us. Completely. So as we said earlier, as we lay on the altar, we give ourselves completely. This is in every area of our life, starting with God. Remember, we talked a couple of weeks ago. If you're vertical, meaning your relationship with God is where it should be, then my horizontal with my brothers and sisters in Christ will line up. If you're pleasing to God, you will be pleasing to man. So in any and everything we do, so that's in our relationships, whether it be in our marriage, as, as children, as brothers and sisters, um, in our giving, um, if we, we have a task to do in the kingdom, from the pulpit to the pew, whatever God has given you to do. And let me tell you something, even if you don't have a specific title for the simple fact you're a child of God, that means you. In any and everything you do, you give it your all. You give God your best. Why is that? Because he gave us his best in Jesus Christ. And because now we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and we have the complete Bible. We are without excuse. Think about anything you do on a given day, in a given week, month, year, so forth. And, and, and think about it. Do I give it the best as if, I, as if I'm giving it to God? Because let me help you out as a Christian. You are. How do you handle difficult situations with difficult people? Remember, we on the altar now. How do we handle ourselves? We've all failed. But I'm saying moving forward, after you ask God to forgive you, how do you handle those difficult situations? There's a way to do it. That's right. How did David handle his relationship with King Saul? Jealous hearted of him. Had him on the run, wanted to kill him. And David's servant was like, let's get him. And David said, touch not my anointing and do my prophet no harm. Even cut the edge of his robe and showed him. Saul. How do we handle difficult situations, difficult people? COVID. How are we handling that with our worship? Remember we said earlier, the mandate's already been given and God simply, Jesus simply said, go. Nothing has changed. The principle is the same and make disciples. Like I said, did none of us stay in the house that full two years? We went somewhere. So as a child of God, you still should be handling kingdom business. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. This is what we're required to offer. It's just not when tithes and offerings come. That's a huge part, but we literally give ourselves. Why? Because he gave us his self. On that cross, God allowed Jesus to give us any and everything we'll ever need on earth and into eternity. So why should it be any different now? I know we're difficult as people. But that still don't stop you from carrying out ministry. Because when you get before God, he ain't going to ask you about so-and-so. He's going to ask what you did with the opportunities he gave you. So blaming it on so-and-so is not going to be acceptable. 
your sacrifice. And because in Western culture, we always equate everything to money, I believe it'll be the same just like it was in the sacrificial system. You still could have gave me something. You still could have gave me something. The woman gave two mites, but it was acceptable. We, we have to get this thing deep down inside. Why? Because in these last days, a lot of people do have ulterior motives inside the realm of the kingdom. But we still have to stay focused, stay focused, stay focused on what God has asked us to do. We have to remember what the commands of God says. And as a result, continue to offer good sacrifices in these tough times. You can't allow yourself to get thrown off. We, and, we, and, and because we're still in here, it's going to be some, some stuff that throws us off. But because you have the Holy Spirit, because you have the Holy Word, and because you have so many examples, you shouldn't stew in it. There will be sickness. There will be death. There will be loss. Because I, I can hear people saying, yeah, Red, but you don't know what I went through. Everybody going through something. Let me help you out. Just because some people ain't as vocal about what's going on in their home. Everybody's going through something. But when you stay close and you stay connected to the kingdom, this tabernacle was in the center. And the 12 tribes were camped around it. And this whole book of Leviticus, they stayed right at the foot of the mountain. There was no movement. Why? Because I'm trying to teach you something. I'm trying to show you something. I'm trying to show you what the value is of being in the presence of God. So now, because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us, he's forever with us. That's the privilege we have. This is what allowed Peter and John, when they was walking to the temple and the man was begging for money, they said, silver and gold I don't have, but such as I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Why? They understood what they possess. And when you understand what you have, you can freely give of that. It ain't no thing. Why? Because God freely gave it to me. I can freely give. At some point, we need to just really sit down and think about what we have as kingdom citizens. If we did, we wouldn't behave the way we do. If Israel did take the time to think back then, they wouldn't have behaved the way they did. Let's not take grace for granted. Because that's literally what it is. I got a get out of jail free card. I'm a child of the king. Cut somebody out. Well, Lord, no, I ain't there yet. All these cliches we use, I'm going to lay down my religion. Well, if you can lay it down, you don't have anything. Yes, ma'am. Can you go to the microphone, please? Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to share that... Um, we were trying to help a young man get a bus pass at my job, right? And so I go to the accounts um, lady and I said, um, what kind of discount can I get today, you know, to get this bus pass for this gentleman? And um, nobody, uh, everybody was on union negotiations and stuff, so nobody couldn't answer the question. So later on that day, she um, said, Christy, come to my office. 
and she gave me a 10 day. She said, I can't give you the monthly pass right now, but I can give you this because of the fact that you're trying to help someone. And I like it how God will open the door if you're trying to help and do his will and everything, and he'll provide for you. Amen. 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 And that's exactly right. And look at it. Let's not get caught up that it's only a 10 day. Ain't no telling what the Lord going to do in them 10 days. Ain't no telling. Ain't no telling. And that's the thing about it. God continually bless. We say it. That the earth is the Lord. And the fullness thereof. And the world that them they dwell in. If that be the case, why are we tripping? If we truly believe that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and everybody that dwells therein, why do we get so anxious as Christians? Yeah, but what about kingdom nature? At some point, we should grow up. And I get it. We, we have this thing called extended adolescence. It's a, it's a term they done gave that's going on in the world now. It's called extended adolescence. That means where usually where between 18 and 21 where you establish, you know, certain things, certain you're, you're responsible to a certain extent. Now that's been extended on into the 30s, the 40s, and all that. It just extended. extended adolescence so I get it but that's the world we're speaking of kingdom kingdom um, look at Matthew 6 33 obedience and offering amen now how many times we done heard this quoted now don't say me don't tell me and don't say it out loud. How often is this obeyed? How often is this obeyed? Concerning in obedience in anything. If you want to understand what God's will is for you right now, Matthew 6, is helping us. There's some times in my life where my parents told me, you need to get your priorities together. Matthew 6, tells us what is the number one kingdom priority. Somebody read it. Amen. Not last. Right. Not after you've tried. And failed in other areas, but seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. And on the back end, I got you. I know what you need. And if you go back a little bit further, he talks about three things that we act a fool over. Finance, food, and fashion. Somebody sitting here right now think about the crock pot they left on. Somebody thinking about where we going to go to eat right now. Today, somebody going to be late because they got to go through all them clothes to go worship. Finance. Money, 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 money. Western culture is so money driven that we don't even see it. Three things that we act a plum fool over food, finance, and fashion. And Jesus is telling us seek him first in his kingdom. And I'll supply everything you need. Yes, ma'am.
Thank you, thank you. And, and, and that's the blessing in it. We talked about it this week while Scott was here, uh, while, while waiting. Do anything, do, do exactly what a good waiter does. Serve in the meanwhile. That can be applied to anything. Just be a good servant in your waiting. Same thing with Israel. They wanted everything right now, right now. Everything in our culture, out right now, right now. Like we pull up a fast food window. Let me get number four. Extra fries, apple pie, supersized drink. By the time I get up to the window, I want my food now. The kingdom of God is not a drive through if he took 42 years, 42 generations, I'm sorry, to bring the Messiah, what makes us think that we don't have to wait? And I love it when you, when you look in, um, in, in the book of Hebrews, some of them waited patiently, but never seen the Messiah. But it didn't stop them in their obedience that they offered to God. Why? Because even if they didn't see it, they knew it was coming. Amen. That's that hope. That's anticipation. So patience is a virtue. And a lot of times when we want something right then, we might end up finding later on, if I got it then, the blessing that I end up getting for waiting wouldn't have been there. Amen. Yes, sir. Okay, that there is truth in that, but let me help clarify. First of all, we're the ones that give Satan a foothold. You, it's the flesh that is wicked. Satan is an opportunist. He capitalizes on our fleshly desires. Satan can only act on what is given to him. So it starts in here. And we run our mouth about it. Then the Satan, I got you. So that's what it is. And the reason why I'm clarifying that is because it's that old adage, the devil made me do it. No, it's something you've been flirting with. And once time and opportunity got together, the devil capitalized on it. But it starts with us. And that's all I'm saying, not to contradict what you said, but it needs to be clarity. Why? Because if you go back into the garden, it was that woman you gave me. It was the serpent. No, God told them not to eat of that tree. But she sat there and stared at it long enough. 
And then the devil came along and capitalized on her meddling. That's how that works. You don't like the mess you got going on? Get your mind right. Get your mind right. And stop giving the devil ammunition to fire back at you. Yes, sir. Amen. It's a choice. Amen. That, that, that sums it up. You got a choice. You got a choice. And that's where we have to be mindful of we, which choice am I going to make? And you, there's only two ways to go. Now I'm talking about as Christians. Am I going to serve God or I'm going to serve the flesh? Who are you going to serve? Now, I'm in this flesh, but God saved me. I'm in this flesh, but God is learning me. I'm in this flesh, but God done planted himself inside of me in the form of the Holy Spirit. So I have a choice in the matter. That's it. Now, you know you've been toiling with something in your head. Don't go meddling with it. Don't nobody got to know that's between you and God. If you know the secret thoughts that you pray, don't come out. If you've been meddling with something in your head, don't you dare go where opportunity is going to be laying waiting on you. If you got a problem with lust, don't go nowhere. Don't watch nothing. Don't listen to a song that will feed into that lust. You got sticky fingers? Keep your hands in your pocket. Protect yourself. I'm, I'm being so serious because you know the issues you deal with. If you quick to come back when somebody say something, keep your mouth shut. If you always laying in the cut like, yep, I got something for a day. Yep, 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 yep. Don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. If you know you like to throw them hands and there's an argument going on, don't you go over there. We have to, you, this is a choice. You have to guard yourself. Why? Because you're a kingdom citizen. And just like God was teaching them about offerings, all that stuff we just went over in the New Testament, being laid prostrate on there, you're offering yourself. So all these different circumstances and situations that come up in your life is a type of offering you give in that situation. And it's real simple. What are you going to offer? The kingdom or your flesh? It's simple. What are you going to offer? Which way are you going to choose? Who are you going to show them? Are you going to show them our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you going to show them your flesh? It's a choice. What are you going to offer? Do not desecrate the kingdom with our fleshly ways. I know it's just you at home and it's just you scrolling through your phone, but you're still a kingdom citizen. And just because nobody sees it don't mean it don't happen. I know they ticked you off, but don't you cuss them out verbally or mentally. I know he or she looks nice and pleasing to you. But treat it just like when you go in a place with expensive things. That's nice, but I can't afford that. Let me keep moving. 
Why? This is your offering. You are a kingdom sit. Hey, y'all, ain't no need to be tiptoeing around the stuff. Because the same sins they committed back then is the same sins we commit now. Only difference is we can get to them quicker and we got a little more money. So quit sugarcoating it. Quit letting all these different topics be taboo. We're laid on that altar. But the, 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 the verse 2 said you got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Philippians said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. One of humility, one that's not title driven, but one that was obedient to his father, even unto death, even death on the cross. Y'all, we got to get back to the basics. We don't let this thing get away from us. We've never lived this good as a people. What are we doing with the blessings of God? Do we freely give? Are we hoarding it to ourselves and living on any old kind of way? And one last thing, it's not about religion, rituals, checking boxes. It's about a relationship. Relationship. Think about who you truly love on this earth. Do you treat them any kind of way? Do you offer them any kind of thing? And if you do, you're wrong. Amen. But if you try to give them their best and try to please them, and you do that down here on earth, what do you think our Heavenly Father deserves? Amen. To the trillionth power. Amen. He deserves our best. Why? Because he gave us our best. And I just spent a couple of more minutes on this because we need to realize that. Because rest assured, just as we're talking about it right now, something's going to come up. Today, this week, and what are you going to offer? You're going to offer them some fleshly things or some things from the kingdom? God bless you. Have a good day. Good morning, church. Once again, let's give our teacher another big round of applause. We get such great teaching. If you really understand the Old Testament system of sacrifices and offerings, it's beautiful how God used that as a blueprint, as an example of what was to come. It's beautiful that God requires us to give us our best. Because ultimately, he gave us his best. I love that. Uh, Saints, we had a total of $73.80 people uh, for Sunday school. I have a special request to all of the parents. I beg you. I plead with you. I ask you. I implore you to please come out to Sunday school on time. It's so many benefits to coming out to Sunday school. Uh, the kids benefit more when they don't come to class halfway into class. You benefit more when you don't come to Sunday school halfway through class. The whole body of Christ benefits by seeing you. You are an encouragement. Amen. 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 So again, I, no one can make you do a thing, but I can ask you and beg you and plead with you to come out to Sunday school each and every week on time. It's for your benefit and for your, your child's benefit. Amen? Thank you for coming out. I know you were blessed. You're now in the hands of the deacons. morning, St. Luke. Man, I am grateful for this church, for our pastor, and for
for this teaching, man, in Sunday school. Man, it's, it, it's powerful. You know, I, you know, I know we're doing this on Facebook Live, and it ain't nothing like coming into the house of the Lord and getting fed firsthand up front. I know we gave Reverend Mike Williams a hand. I just want to get a brother another hand. Clap. That man on fire. That man is teaching and preaching. You know, I thank God for the whole roster of teachers and preachers and pastors we have here at St. Louis. Feed our flock, man. We are blessed. We are blessed. So our scripture this morning will be coming from the book of Psalms 51. Psalms 51. If you're able, please stand. That's Psalms 51. When you have it, say amen. If you don't have it, say hold on. Hold on. Hold on. You know, I was thinking about uh, in, a, in a Sunday school lesson is, you know, we think about no weapon formed against us shall prosper, right? So oftentimes, I got to make sure that that weapon formed against myself is not me being the weapon, you know? Because sometimes I can be that weapon against my own self in the things I do and the way I behave. So I have to be mindful of that. You know, Psalms 51, we have it, and it reads, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving, loving kindness, according to, unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thy might as be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall clean. Wash me, and I <clears throat> excuse me, shall be withered with snow, then snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. I read to you Psalms 51, 1 through 10. The Lord's word is already blessed. You may be seated. I was glad when they said, let us, not me by myself, let us go into the house of the Lord. Shall we pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, how will be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come this morning thanking you for lying down last night and getting up early this morning. Early this morning we rose to come and worship, on, worship your holy name, oh, Heavenly Father. And we just, just want to say thank you, Father, because you've been good to us. Oh, you, you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves, oh, Heavenly Father. We thank you now, oh, Heavenly Father, for our pastor in his absence, oh, Heavenly Father, this morning. He had to go down, go away to preach somewhere else. But, oh, Heavenly Father, we pray that him and Sister Malone had great traveling grace to a destination. We, oh, Heavenly Father, we pray for Reverend Jones. We pray for our church family, the, the choir, the deacons. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just pray for every individual who will come to this church, oh, Heavenly Father. If somebody is hurting, please let us know. And then we will come talking to you and let you know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So we thank you now this morning, O Heavenly Father. We love you. We praise you. We lift up your holy name because the glory 
belongs to you, not us. It honor belongs to you, not us. We just thank you this morning. We love you this morning, oh Heavenly Father. We thank you for Reverend Scott this week coming doing the revival, oh Heavenly Father. We just pray that each individual that came out and heard him teach us got something out of it because I know I did. Oh Heavenly Father, trying to get my life better with you. I, we thank you now. We love you. We pray for the sick and shut in this morning. People's in the hospital. We thank you for Malcolm get to come home, oh Heavenly Father. I went to see him and he was laying there and I noticed he was a little discouraged. But I prayed with him and oh Heavenly Father and I told him it's going to be all right. Just put your hand in God's hand and everything is going to be all right. So Wednesday night, Thursday, Friday night, he came home, oh, Heavenly Father. And we thank you. We have something to thank you for this morning, oh, Heavenly Father. You've been good. You don't miss us so too much. Because, oh, Heavenly Father, you said we're not going to heal. He'll to give us something to hurt us. He always going to give us something to help us. Because I'm a one of his child. I'm in his kingdom. And I'm going to stay in this kingdom, oh, Heavenly Father. I just feel so good this morning. I just thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. You've been good. In Jesus' name, amen. Now you're in the hands of the choir. I'm asking all choir members to come to choir stand, please. morning St. Luke. Truly this is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We choose to rejoice and be glad in it. So glad and thankful for God allowing us to be here. Amen. He's been good to us. Amen. Thank God for grace and mercy. Amen. It's no goodness of our own that we're here but it's God's grace, amazing, it's truly amazing. The psalmist says, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. In the house of we ought to find joy, love, peace, happiness. Amen. And we are glad. And we are glad. Get the highest praise. Hallelujah. You are holy God. 
say right there. The psalmist says, make a joyful noise. Joyful. Anybody joyful on today? It goes on to say, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. Anybody thankful? Anybody thankful? All right. And bless his name. If you're thankful, you'll bless his name. If you're grateful, you'll bless his name. Come on, praise with us.
glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. We're going to leave it right there. Oh, let everything that have breath, let everything that have breath, that's a whole house. That's a whole house. That's what it says. And for me and my house, and I believe Pastor would say that on behalf of St. Luke, we come to praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. We're done. kept singing, sing the, sing the nervousness out of me, but the Lord is good anyhow, make me think about Reverend Upton, he used to say, I decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Oh, no turning back. I want to thank Pastor Malone for this opportunity. Him and his wife in her absence. I'm going to be coming from Luke chapter 15. Deal with the little son. Chapter 15, Luke 15. Can you hear me now? All right. Luke 15, starting at verse 11. It reads, Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possession with prodigal living but when he had spent all there arose a severe famine in that land and he began to be in want then he then he want, went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent and he sent him into his field to feed swines and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the paws that, that the swines ate, and no one gave him anything. But he, this, is the, this is the verse that I want to base my sermon off of. And it said, but he came to himself. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I would rise and go to my father, and I would say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and, and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like 
uh, like one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Let's stop right there. I, I think we all know the rest of the story. I'm still breathing hard. But I wanted to I wanted to share my testimony and then I was gonna go into my sermon, but I'm gonna share my testimony first. A lot of you guys don't know me. I wanna share my testimony and then we go back into the sermon, if you don't mind. As a young man growing up in Tennessee, life wasn't easy. I am the tenth of the, of eleven children. To uh, make things worse, my parents separated when I was five years old. My, mo my mother moved us from Whiteville, Tennessee to Bolivar, Tennessee. So I'm a Tennessean. This move was in God's plan. Because that, be because of that, when, when my, mother be my mother became a Christian, I will never forget how she, became, how she began to teach us about the Bible and take us to church. Since we attended church on Saturday, Friday evening were used to go over our assignments. The Bible was my uh, best subject. Since I was so eager to learn, I was moved up to my older sister's class. After only four years in Bolivar, we moved to Memphis, Tennessee. I continued to learn the word and, and, uh, take act, and take an active role in the church's basketball team and voting league. In 1984, we moved to Beloit, Wisconsin. This move weakened our bond. When I was in Beloit, when we, when we was in Beloit, my sister be, be, began to fall away from God's word and the church. And I was my mom's last child to leave the church. I was 17 years old. It really hurt my mother. I had fallen like the rest of my brothers and sisters. Shortly, shortly afterward, afterwards, I moved back to Tennessee when I finished school. One day, just like the prodigal son, I woke up and I came to myself. And I realized how much I had let God and my mom down. I told God that if he get me out of this situation, I would serve him the rest of my life. God led me to Rockford where he has put people around me to lead me and guide me and teach me and nurture me. One such person is Deacon Ray Wilson, a man I met on my job. One night he led me to Christ by explaining that Christ died for my sins. I'll never forget that night. Although I have taught, I was taught the word Christ was left out. So many people know who God is but they don't have a relationship with Jesus, his son. So the church that I attended, we basically was taught out of the Old Testament. So I learned very little about Jesus. One such person was Deacon Ray Wilson. Although I was taught the word, Christ was left out. I thank God for Deacon Ray in my path. After being converted, everything I was taught came back to me that was true about God's word. I was then baptized. God helped me to lead my sister Annie, her daughter, and other people to Christ. God used this digging to help me. Over the years, I've learned and received many certifications from classes by the district. God used this community of people to shape me, mold me, and to prepare me for ministry. He has placed me where he wants me to be today. Before God could use me, he had to, I had to, to surrender to his will, wholeheartedly. Accept his son, leave out, leave out the dark state, and come into his marvelous light. Matthew 11, 28. I know I was saved to serve. I was not saved to sit. I would not sit down on God. And so we'll leave it at that. 
and what I want to deal with is, is, is the prodigal son. So I see myself in that similar type of situation. But in this lesson, pride is the key. He had a prideful attitude. And so pride keeps us from God. It, it separates us from God. It's a dangerous thing. And so pride is a dangerous thing. Pride separates us from God. Proverbs 11 and 2 said, when pride comes, then comes, comes shame, but, when, but with the humble is wisdom. So, so, so we have to be careful that when I look this word pride up, it said that only the ordinary man has pride in his life. See, the Christian man has the Holy Spirit in him. And so he keeps us on the straight and narrow. But the sinful man, the prideful man, he governs himself. He, he uh, does what he wants to do. Notice in verse 12, the young, the young man said to his father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. Notice, notice the terms that he used, give me. What if my son came to me and said, Dad, I want my insurance money right now. Well, in order for him to get the insurance money, I would have to be what? Dead. And so he was actually saying that. Okay? Pride makes us want to live a life independent of God. And so often, we don't come to God because we want to be our own boss. We want to do things our way. And a lot of times, we, we don't come to him because the simple fact that we're still living in darkness. Darkness does not love the light. And so, so, so often, pride keeps us from God. The young, the, the, the young man no longer wanted to live under his father's roof. He thought the grass was greener on the other side. And, 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 and so often, you know, the world captured our attention. You know, the Christian man is supposed to be traveling down the narrow way. But, but too often we find ourselves captivated by the things of this world. And it sways us away from God. You know what I'm saying? So, and so the wide way has no boundaries. Uh, you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, you can have multiple partners. You can smoke. You can cuss. You can do whatever you want to do. But, 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 but there's a narrow way. That's a narrow way. And that's the way that, that God wants us to go. But too often, we choose the wide way. The, the world gets our attention uh, through a lot of areas. You know, the world system don't love the, the things of God. You know, like God has an order of things and Satan has an order of things. So they, they're, they clash often. They, they clash often. Often. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful. But getting back to the story, this young man comes to his father. His father then took care of him. Uh, his father was a rich man. A man that had plenty. But this young man wanted to leave his father's house. Like us. As young people, we, we, we think what our parents is, is, is telling us is wrong. They, they've been young before, so they know the way. But too often, we don't want to follow them. And so, and so the young man went to his father, asked his father to give him his portion. So now he's on his way, and that's us. When we separate ourselves from God, we go down. Notice, notice that when he left his father's house, he began to go down. 
So when we leave God's presence, when we don't follow God's uh, rules, we go down. So notice he went down pretty fast. Pretty fast. So, so we need to be careful that we don't get caught up in the things of this world. Not only that, but the young man broke the fifth commandment. The, 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 the fifth commandment says, obey your father and mother. Honor your mother, mother and your father, right? So he broke that commandment. Too, too often, we don't respect our parents like we should do, especially young people. We need to honor our parents. You know, my mom was my first teacher. She taught me about God. You know, she's still living for the Lord. I can't go in, in, in my mom's house and uh, talk about any old thing. She would tell me, come back. Could you please leave? Because she run a godly house. When, when I stayed with my mom, I had to be in the house at 9 o'clock at 20 years old. Because she said, this is God's house. And then I had to hang the phone up by 9 o'clock. So sometimes she would hang the phone up while I was talking on it. Why? That was her house. She used to always say, this is God's house, this is God's phone. So, so... So, so I can imagine that the prodigal son probably got tired of the rules in the house. And so he decided to leave. You know, and uh, sometimes we think that we know more than our parents do. You can never grow up to your parent. Never. And then Ephesians, uh, over in the book of of, of Ephesians, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise. And, and uh, too often, the reason our children are like they are because they listen to other children. Notice, notice when your children come home, they, they, they say stuff like, well, Mike got the new nights. Am I correct? And then we go buy the new nights. Well, you know, uh, 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 such and such got a new outfit. And then you go buy him a new outfit. So, so God has given the parents the authority, not the children. And so, but what I really like about this story too, is that the father let the son go. He didn't chase him down. He didn't, he didn't send no one to, to uh, look for him. Okay. And so, so sometimes we need to let our kids go on their own. Let them find their way. Don't stand in their way. I don't think neither one of my sons would say that I stand in their way. They're two young adults. So they're responsible for their own choices. And so we need to get out of our children's way. That way they can run into God. You know, two too often we're in God's way. Don't do this. Did you go to church? Did you read? Did you pray? Did you do this? Get out of their way. Let God have his way. Pro Proverbs 14 and 12 says, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end result is death. So too often, we got all these plans. I remember walking in the hospital talking to this guy. And he had three businesses, right? He had three businesses. And he said, man, I'm going to retire. And I'm going to go back to Hawaii. But guess what? His kidney failed him. So he never made it back home. So he ended up dying. So, you know, we always want to get our finance fixed. But it's your life fixed with God. We're going to get our finance fixed. We want to invest our money. We want to we want to do buy a fancy house and stuff like that. But do you have the right relationship with God? That's what counts at the end. In Matthew 7 and 13, it said, enter the narrow gate. 
For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there is many who go in by it. So, so no one wants, wants to take the narrow way. We like the wide way, the bling bling. There's plenty of women and men and, and drinking and partying and stuff like that. But that's the bad way. That's the wrong way. That way is full of heartache and pain. So in verse 17, we see, like I said, this is the best part to me. The young man had came to himself. See, when you come to yourself, you're going somewhere then. And uh, too often, a lot of our children, our friends, and loved ones haven't come to themselves yet. They're still suffering. Why? Because the Bible says pride goes before the fall. And so they're going to stay where they're at. Pride got a way of holding you up. Have you ever seen somebody like that? that I don't have to use drugs, but it could be anything. But I had a friend of mine, and he used to drink a lot and smoke cigarettes and stuff. And he was he, he was a ladies' man, you know what I'm saying? But but the liquor had took its toll on him. But so 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 pride had him thinking that he still looked good, that he still had it, you know what I'm saying? But 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 he looked it bad. But pride of how you thinking that you still got it. You know, the women still looking at me. You know what I'm saying? I'm still, you know. So pride is a dangerous thing. That's why people can't come to God right away because of pride. Pride is dangerous. You know, and so the young man, now he's suffering. Uh, he done ran out of money. His friends then left him. And now he's thinking about how good he had. He's thinking about how, how he had food in his father's house. Uh, 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 he had probably had servants waiting on him at his father's house. He had all and much more at his father's house. And he started to thinking about how good he had it. So you don't wake up until you start thinking like that. And so... He realized this, and, and the Bible said that he headed towards home. That's a good thing when you headed towards home. And so he thought about, and this is very important because he repented to heaven. And then he thought about what he was going to tell his father. Oh, yeah, he's going somewhere. Because he, he realized that he was wrong. He had godly sorrow. Okay, and, and uh, too often we'll lie. We'll say, well, I ain't going to do this again. But we turn right back around and we're back in the same mess. God do not have to continue to bail us out of our mess. He don't have to. He don't have to do that. So the young man had godly sorrow. He had really changed. And he realized how he had let his father down. So we're going somewhere. We, we're going somewhere when we realize that we have wronged God. We're headed, he was headed back home. And in this story, the young man noticed that before he got to that point, he had many friends. You know, people cleanse to you when you got money. Oh, they're not going to let you go anywhere, friend. When you got, got money, you, they're going to they gonna cleanse to you. They're not going to let you go. Because you got something that they need. And they'll keep helping you out along the way. But time no money run out. They, they'll come up with all type of excuses. I can't come that way. I'm not going that way today. And they let you down, you know what I'm saying? So this young man, uh, friends had let him down. And he had to go and work for somebody in their fields. Okay? But notice that the scripture says that he was hungry. And so when I looked this up about the pause, see, 
a human being couldn't eat the parts. Why? Because they couldn't digest the parts. So he, he thought about eating it. It, it, it. it shows how low that this young man was. He, he, he was low. And sometimes we get real low in life. And that's when God can talk to us the most. He can, he can, he can, he can really get our attention when, when, when then there's nobody around us no more. We didn't, we didn't ran out of money. Uh, the young lady that we was talking to, she gone or he's gone. And then you done lost your job. That's when God is at his best. He's at his best then, my friend, because he know that you're going to look up now. You're going to look up now because the simple fact that, that we know that when we get something, we don't even think about God. Oh, man, we might not have a relationship, a pretty good relationship and a good job, a nice car, a nice house. Oh, my God. God ain't thought about But we got to get down in a bad situation for God to matter. It ain't good. I think Matthew 6 and 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And guess what, my friend? And then the things will come. But we got to put God where he belongs. See, when God made you and I, he push it, put a special little hole in our heart for him. But guess what, friend? We got everything else in the hole. We got woman in the hole. We got man in the hole. We got money in the hole. Come on now. We got gambling in the hole. Oh, I'm not saying nothing about gambling. But you, you know what? We got so many different things in God's place. We're going to continue to suffer till we take everything out of God's place and put God where he belongs in our life. In John, 1 John 1, 7 through 9. Just read a portion of it. It said, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. In the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. All sin. You know, so this young man is on his way back home. He looks up to heaven and he repents. We can't come back unless we, we repent. How often we be gone from the church for what five or six months? We just walk in like nothing. We just come, just come and sit here. <laughs> we come back and, and we sit in our favorite seat like nothing happened. I'm like, wow, wow. We, we just come into church, just high five everybody like nothing never happened. You can't do that. I don't know if I did that or not, but the first thing that I spoke to, did when I got up here was apologize to the church for my inconsistency in the last two or three months, years. But I want to, I want to do, yeah, years. And, and so, so I, I come to do better. I want to do better. And lastly, nobody in this room is exempt from trouble. I don't know why we think like that. But you know, one thing about pride, pride to have you thinking high-minded. But nothing ever happened to me. I got a good job. My wife loved me. My kids in college. And we, 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 we got this high-minded thing going on. You know, I was telling a brother... Dwayne, that uh, Dr. Chuck Swindle, I know a lot of y'all don't listen to Dr. Chuck Swindle, but I do. And he was saying that, 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 uh, that, that when the people look up in the pulpit, they should know that we got a relationship with God. They should, they should see that we have a spiritual life. You know what I'm saying? But too often, that's not the case. It's not the case. We, but the Christians, period, need, need to walk in the spirit. It's just not the people in the poor pit, but they need to see it in us, though. Or, or we need to go down there and sit. Because 
they need to see something different about us. It's just the truth anyway. But I'm talking about me. I'm not pointing the finger. And so the, the prodigal son, I thought about myself. That's the reason I shared my story because I strayed away too from my mom's teaching, even though, you know, she only taught me what she knew. And, and then later on, I was able to come back and sit with my mom and say, now listen, this part wasn't right. You understand what I mean? I know y'all probably can't do that, but you know, me and my mom got that type of relationship. She's teachable. Okay? And so I was able to sit down with my mom and say, no, you, you know, this is not what that means. You know what I'm saying? And so it's very important that we have the right type of relationship with, with, with the Jesus Christ. Everybody know who God is, but nobody is interested in his son. Very little people. Now, you can tell me that you love me, but if you don't love my son, if, if you don't love my son, uh, I got a problem with that. Now, you, you want to love on me, but you don't want to love my son. I got a problem with that. And I think God got a problem with that. So, so often we want to talk about God and we want to use the word higher power. You know what I'm saying? But, but I'm kind of straying away from my message, so I'm going to leave that alone. But, but, the point, but the point is this, that I like the fact that the prodigal son came to his senses. That's the good part of the story. We like to talk about the love and stuff like that, but the father, oh, we already know that the father represents God, and we represent the prodigal son. But the good thing is he came to his senses. Because guess what? He could have died out there. He could have died out there. But he realized that he don't have to stop. He don't have to stay out there. It's a, it's a, it's a choice. It's a choice to stay away from God. It's a choice. It's a choice. I want to do better this year. Like, like now. I'm not going to wait till the end of the year to say, make no resolution. Oh, I want to do right now. Like today. You know what I'm saying? We, we have to do better. And that young man was so glad to be back home. But guess what? God is so glad when we come back too. Notice what the, notice what the father said. Go get a rope. Go get a ring. Go get the fatty calf, the best. My son was lost. And now he's been found. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. Because a lot of us don't make it back. We don't make it back. A friend of mine told me, and I'm finna, I'll be done. I'm finna be done. Is that he said, Randall, my mom passed away. And she didn't get a chance to see me get clean. He said, man, it bothered me, man. It bothered me, man. She's for years. She, the only thing she said was, "Son, get right with God." She didn't. She didn't beat him up. She didn't press him down or nothing like that. She said, just get right with God. She, but she died, and he he didn't get a chance. She she didn't get a chance to see him clean. You know what I'm saying? That that is sad because we got a choice. God can clean us up. I used to have a bad attitude. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about a rotten attitude. You know what I'm saying? But God got a way of changing things. Now, that man do flare up every now and then. But the Holy Spirit said, now you know you don't like jail. So, then I, okay, okay, you know. I'm just saying, y'all don't like to go to jail now. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just keeping it real. So, okay, okay. And I'll close it off by saying this. I went to uh, Super Suds. Anybody been to Super Suds? Just me. I went to Super Suds to get my oil changed because the last time I went there, uh, they charged me 88 bucks. You know, I got a Mercedes, so that was a deal to me. So I went over there, and the man, man changed my oil. He said, that'll be 149 I said, okay. 149 They jumped from $88 to, to $149? Okay. Go ahead and change it, man. 
Oh, the man changed my oil, and I would have pardoned the mind. So he said, man, let's go by my house. So we went by his house. And I said, hold on, I'm going to check my oil, man. So, so I popped the trunk. I mean, hood. And there's very little oil on that. Man, I flew back over there. I said, man, let me. Man, I didn't give you 149 bucks, and you, you, didn't, you didn't. But the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Sir. Listen, could you please check my oil again? You didn't, you didn't, I don't think it's right. You get it? I didn't go over there jumping up and down. I wanted to, but remember, I don't like jail. Okay. We're going to, we're going to close it off at that, but let's, let's, be, let's, let's do right by God. Let's, you know, maybe. Maybe this sermon wasn't for you. You know, I was nervous, but but it's okay. It's okay. You know what? You know, you know, you know, I just, you know, when you speak for God, you, you want to do what's right. You want to say what's right. You want you want to you know give it your best. You know what I'm saying? But too often we got a lot of prideful people, and they and they critiquing you right now. Oh, he didn't say this, and <clears throat> he didn't open up with prayer and stuff like that. You know it's okay. It's okay. Prideful people make me better, make me stronger. You know what I'm saying? And so I want to just. Thank, thank God for this opportunity. I want to thank my son for being here, Demetrius. I don't know if my other son out here, but he's supposed to came. And uh, I just want to thank the pastor for this opportunity and all the ministers in the roster. Thanks a lot. Let's encourage this preacher. Let's encourage him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He, he gave us that sermon by way of his personality. Don't ever judge preachers by someone else's personality. And he was transparent. And most of all, he came from the word. Amen. Encourage him. Encourage him. Encourage. You have no idea when you're tapped on the shoulder to preach the burden, wrestling with that text all week, preparing yourself, and then you stand before God's people, and there's some faces that look at you in such a way. But what he gave us was the truth. And now it's time to extend the invitation. And he said some things. The preacher reminded us last week, if we'll move that pride aside and offer God a praise and not our prideful way, we'd be in a better position. He, he showed by way of the prodigal son. And it, it, this, this text, this, this sermon was for two people. One who doesn't know the Lord. But then it was also for somebody who knows the Lord and who done strayed. Now, if you don't know the Lord and this, this message touched you, if you hear that voice, if you hear that tug, that instinct, whatever your conscience, whatever you want to call it, that's the Lord telling you, you need to accept him by way of his son, Jesus Christ. I know you don't put it off. You don't came in here. You're watching and you watch sermon after sermon. You say, I'll wait, I'll wait. But I'm here to tell you who's to say that life will present you a chance, another chance to hear the word of God. So if you heard the word today and you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, allow him to be Lord. Will you come? Is there one? Will you come? You are the is there one? And then there's someone 
that's sitting here today in the sanctuary or watching. You're a child of God, but you stray. And you're ashamed, and you're like that prodigal son. You, you done stooped so low that you can't do nothing. But, but you remember what the Word of God says. And you miss that peace, that joy that you once had in your father's house. Will you come back? Will you come? Will you come? Will you come? You are Come with our brother Jerome. He's coming to rededicate his life to Christ. Amen. Amen. Is there another? Is there another? Is there another? There might be somebody watching. You're not here. And if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, pray this prayer with me. Lord, based on what I've heard, I understand that I'm a sinner. I want to repent. I've done wrong in your sight and against you and you only have I sinned. I'm asking you right now, in his name, will you come into my heart, Heavenly Father, and make me a new creature. If you prayed that prayer, you're a new creature. It's, it's simple. We, we Sometimes we plow this thing with too many words. But the scripture says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So what you need to do now is reach out to us. Make sure we get your information. Put it in the chat. Call up to the church um, tomorrow, sometime this week, so we can get your information. And we can now help you in your walk. You've entered a relationship, not religion. Not, not, not a religion, not a, a ritual, but a relationship. So you need to learn about this God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ. Is there anyone else to come? Will you come? Don't let it pass you by. And listen here. Shouldn't be no shame. Shouldn't be no shame. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Ain't a one of us in here from the pulpit to the pew hasn't made a mistake. While the blood is running warm in your veins. about it even though we've ended the invitation here in our service it's always continually extended you should be able to because no one else came that means everyone else is saved so you should be able to ask any man any woman sitting in this sanctuary about leading you to Jesus Christ as your savior So don't let this day pass. Even if you didn't want to come over, the invitation is still extended. Don't walk out of here today not knowing if you die today, whether you'll wake up in heaven or hell. I'm telling you, don't do it. Don't do it. Amen. Amen. We thank God for the word today. What a gracious God we serve. Amen. Now as the ushers are coming, we're going to prepare ourselves for tithes and offerings. You know, we talked about in Sunday school today about obedience and offerings. We've been commanded to give God a portion of what he's blessed us with. So this is still part of your worship. This is still part of your obedience. And he don't ask for it all. He just asks for a portion. Amen? Amen. Now you're in the hands of the ushers.
shared. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you Reverend Malone for allowing us to have our dad's home going here at St. Louis. We appreciate each and every one who came and supported our family during this time. Robin, Dennis, Tina, and Joe and family. Amen. Amen. Uh, Mount Sinai Baptist Church presents um, Spencer Taylor and the Highway QCs of Washington, D.C., the Men of Sinai, Rockford, Illinois, the Christian Jubilees of Beloit, Wisconsin. Tickets are $20 in advance and $25 at the door. Children 12 and under, $10. For information, please call 815-716-3744 or 815-964-3744. Five eight five two. The host church will be United Faith Baptist Church, 250 North Pierpont in Rockford, Illinois. 
And it, will, it will be Friday, like I said, Friday, November 4th at 7 p.m. LifeScape Senior Mental Health Program. The Senior Mental Health Program is here to assist with building resilience and increasing mental health well-being among older, older adults. Depression is not a natural part of, of aging. Um, see, the program includes mental health related screenings, education and awareness, home visits, case management, and advocate, advocacy, referral to support services within LifeScape Services Program, referral to mental health and health care providers, mental health first aid initial crisis interventions. Please refer to Senior Mental Health Advocate at 815-968-0522. And this is from LifeScape. Pilgrim Baptist Church, the Reverend Dr. Jonathan L. Williams, Senior Pastor. Reverend, Do Reverend Dr. Lewis Malone and Congregation. We are hosting a revival entitled A Spontaneous Revival Experience with the, with the amazing guest preacher and former pastor of Pilgrim, Reverend Dr. Steve Bland, Jr., the senior pastor of Liberty Temple Baptist Church of Detroit, of Detroit Michigan. The Pilgrim Baptist Church Spontaneous Revival, will, revival Experience will take place at Pilgrim on Tuesday, October 25th, Wednesday, October 26th, and Thursday, October 27th starting at 7 p.m. nightly. This is from Dr. Reverend, Reverend Dr. Jonathan L. Williams. The Gospel Music Workshop of America. Brother, Brother Rodney Lockhart Chapter, Representative Brother Howard Ritchie, Assistant Chapter. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Gospel Music Workshop of America, Rockford Chapter Choir, will celebrate 30-plus years of service to the Northern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin region. Our theme will be give, will, our theme will, we will give you praise. Psalms 9 and 1, Psalms 28 and 7, and Psalms 63, 3 and 4. We invite all previous members of the illustrious of the illustrious choir to join us for rehearsal every Monday, 6.30 p.m. at the Providence Baptist Church, 2209 Clifton Avenue, Rockford, Illinois. We invite all to join us for a gospel music concert Sunday, October 30th at 4 p.m. at Providence Baptist Church. We, ante we are anticipating a great time in the Lord in worship, singing praise to our God. This is Brother Rodney Lockhart, chapter. Uh, Baptist, State, Baptist General State Women's Auxiliary will be having a luncheon Tuesday, October 25th. The van to Peoria will leave St. Luke parking lot at 10 a.m. This is for the state's, the state's women's luncheon, which will, will start at 12 noon. For any questions, please see Sister Beverly Edwards today. If you will, if you be, if you will be riding on the bus on the van. Thank you. And these are your morning announcements. Please govern yourselves accordingly. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to make an announcement on that behalf of the pastor's aid. Starting the month of November, we'll be celebrating our pastor's anniversary. Amen. And on the uh, fourth Sunday, and on the fourth Sunday, we're asking all ministries to bring your gifts that we're going to give to the pastor and this first lady. Thank you. didn't have altar calls, so we'll have prayer and then we'll dismiss. Amen. Amen. And just whatever you're dealing with, give
give it to God. Amen. Amen. He's proven time and time he can handle it. Amen. Amen. Most gracious Father, we come to you right now just to say thank you. Thank you for another day, another beautiful worship service that you allowed us to be a part of, Heavenly Father. But most of all, we learn so much more about your son, Jesus Christ, and reminded he is truly the only way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to you but by him. So we thank you for that. We thank you for the messenger. <clears throat> bless and strengthen him, his household, as you see fit. We ask you bless and strengthen this ministry, Heavenly Father. 42 years you've been gracious to us, Heavenly Father. And we're thankful that for that. Bless and strengthen our pastor. Give him traveling grace as they head back home today, Heavenly Father. And we just thank you. You've done so much, Heavenly Father. We thank you for the praise reports we got on last week. One of our members was able to come home from the hospital, Heavenly Father. We thank you for just continue to heal him physically and spiritually as you see fit through your Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father. So many other people have been healed from surgeries and illnesses, Heavenly Father. But also we have those amongst us who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Comfort them. They get so many calls leading up to the funeral, but now and after, Heavenly Father, comfort their hearts. And let us be a help and not a hindrance to them that the same comfort we receive, we comfort them with that also, Heavenly Father. So many wonderful things about you, Heavenly Father, and we're just thankful. And we just ask that you just continue to work on us, Heavenly Father, from the inside out. And as we apply your word, we be a living witness in this dark world that someone come forth and ask, what must I do to be saved? It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Have an awesome week.